Welcome back. This segment is really very special to us. We had an amazing opportunity to interview an icon, someone we have watched in the media for so many years. Montel Williams is joining us to talk about his MS Second Act initiative. He is partnering with Novartis and the Multiple Sclerosis Association of America to bring forth the message and the importance of multiple sclerosis in our society, how to help people survive and thrive, and also how to be a thriver if you are affected by MS, either personally or through someone you love or know. So this was really a special interview, and we can't wait to bring it to you, so stay with us. Montel, thank you so much for joining us today. It is an honor and a pleasure to meet you. And I know Amy is totally starstruck. So I'm totally I'm starstruck. Ah! Thank you. Thank you. How many times, Montel, have I watched your show? Like so many. You are a staple in my growing up years. So it, thank you it's so much. Really a pleasure. So to take advantage of the little time that we do have together, tell us a little bit about your journey with MS, because you were such a public figure, and then you really did drop out of sight. Well, you know, it's really very interesting, though, but, but I, I, uh, my journey started with MS back in 1980, before I graduated from Naval Academy. For the next 19 years, I got misdiagnosed probably no less than 60 times before I finally went through an episode about in... 1999 that was debilitating enough that it literally forced me to go to a doctor and literally go through some tests that finally clinically I was diagnosed with MS. But I then stayed on the air for another nine years after my diagnosis. So when I, when he said I dropped out, I, I literally think that during that nine year period of time, I had an opportunity to share with people how my disease was progressing and, and how I was coping with the disease, and you know, I even created what I consider a brand now, which is Living Well with Montel, which was trying to find out as much as I could possibly find out about MS, and then make sure I had an opportunity to share that with the public. I wrote three books about my journey with MS, and um, Climbing Higher, Living Well with Montel, and Living Well Emotionally. Um, all three books were books that, that I, I, I wrote to give people an understanding of just, you know, what one person's journey with MS was like. It, I, I really love what you said about that just now, especially living well emotionally, because my uncle Alan, he was one of the original Osmond brothers. He mm. was diagnosed with I MS. I know your uncle, by the way. You know, do you know Alan? Absolutely, I've met oh with your uncle. Gosh. I know, oh. I've sat and talked a couple of times. I was out at the, uh, what is the Stadium of Fire event a couple of years back. That's right. Also met him at a couple of other events, and uh, he, he's, he's an inspiration. He really is an inspiration. I was just hanging out with him at the talk with Marie and Alan on Monday, actually. And it, it is so neat to see him. He's lived with it for 25, 30 years now. He's still getting around. He is a little bit debilitated, but he can still walk. He can still do so many things. And his attitude now is better than it ever has been. He says, I have MS, but MS does not have me. And, and I been, see, yeah. That's been my mantra since day one. I mean, I, you know, when I got diagnosed, I mean, I figured that the doctor said, you have MS, well, fine. I have MS, but MS doesn't have me, and I'm not going to let it have me. And I think it's that kind of attitude that is so pervasive in those who thrive with this disease rather than succumb to it. Absolutely. You know, Alan's son, David, also has MS. He originally contracted it. Um, it he was misdiagnosed with having West Nile virus initially. He's my age. He's 40 years old. And uh, 20 years ago, his MS was so bad that he had to get steroids just to walk to his own wedding. And to be able to see what he's been able to do for the next 20 years, I just have so much love and respect for you and what you're doing. And, and this kind of brings us into our next question, which is, why did you decide to partner with Novartis on the MS Second Act program? Yeah, you know, it's really kind of crazy, but this, this the, the Novartis and the MSAA, which is the MS Association of Americas, they both partnered together um, to put this program together as an educational tool for other MS survivors who really need to know more information about the symptoms of their progression, of their, how the, the progression of this disease takes place, and also about something called secondary progressive MS, which is you know, categorically now 
that we've created new categories. It's just something that everyone with, well, about 80% of the people who have remitting relapsing MS like myself will eventually end up with secondary progressive MS. So when Novartis reached out to me, it was really kind of crazy. About 10 years ago, I attempted to do something similar to this myself on my own, on my own website, with something called the Faces of MS, where I really reached out to people who had MS, and I put faces of thousands of people on a website, trying to have us all communicate and understand that, you know, a journey by yourself is one that can be rewarding, but you never gain the amount of knowledge that you need to gain. And a journey with others is something that gives you a shared opportunity to have some other people who can recognize what you're going through, you can recognize in them what you're going through, share triumphs, share difficulties, and at the end of the day, help us all move forward, and like I say, thrive rather than succumb. Mm. So the second that Novartis really asked me if I wanted to do this, I was absolutely in. And I'm so proud of the program that they're putting together, especially it's called, you know, My MS Second Act, but it gives MS survivors the tools that they need to be able to look back in their own life and look at themselves, really, really reflect upon where they are, and then be able to put together a story that they can share with others Mm -hmm. in a way that I think will help to empower us to not only seek the answers that we need to seek from our doctors, but also share with our loved ones and caregivers what we're going through in a way that they'll understand it also. So what are some of those tools? I'm, I'm assuming this is also the advice you give to anyone who's going through the struggle right now. Well, I mean, and with my MSAA.org, you can go up and find out how to tell your story. It's really interesting that you know, a lot of people who, who suffer with MS suffer in silence because it's one of those illnesses that's really hard for people to understand if you don't have it. And, and I know that, that that seems a little, you know, lofty in some way or, or odd for me to say, but, you know, the old saying of walking in someone else's shoes, you can't walk in the shoes of a person who has an MS. Because oftentimes we who have it can't even explain what we're going through. You know, yeah, it's a disease that you can, you, can, you can see the physical manifestations, but I will tell you that in some cases the physical manifestations are only – 40 to 45% of what a person is going through. It's what you can't see. It's the pain. It's the, the denial. It's the lack of, of, of wanting to admit that you even have an illness because there's a stigma that goes along with the idea that I have something that makes me weak. Well, I may not, I may have MS, but that doesn't mean that I'm weak. That's and right. oftentimes a lot of people who have MS can't even form those words to say that to their caregiver. It's hard for me to explain to, let's say even the two of you. I mean, uh, I I suffer from my worst symptom is neuropathic pain. But that's not the kind of pain that comes from hitting your finger with a hammer, or it's not the kind of pain that comes from stepping on the nail. It's the kind of pain that becomes a part of your soul. And even when I stop to think about it, it can manifest when I don't want it to. I spend most of my time trying to keep it locked up in a box so I don't have to deal with it. And there's so many of us who do the same thing. So it's hard for me to explain that to a person when I say that, you know, I wake up and sometimes I don't even want to put my feet on the ground. But I have to because I just woke up in the morning, I go to the bathroom. So for me to get that 10 feet from here to the bathroom, I got to take steps. And every one of those steps hurts so badly. Sometimes I want to take a hammer and hit myself in the, in the, in the knee so that I can really feel another pain. Yeah. I, I don't understand it, but as a relative, I'm close to it. And I really appreciate you expressing that because just last week I was talking to Dave, uh, my cousin who has MS my age, and I said, how are you doing? And he says, every day is so painful. And he's got this beautiful, like beautiful, funny, engaging veneer. And he is a true, you can, you can tell he's got such a great soul, just like you do. And 
the way that you rise above it, you rise above that pain, I think makes you an even better person than the rest of us. But it is so hard sometimes as someone who loves this person to be able to say, how can I actually help you? How can I be there for you when you're not experiencing that same level of pain? So what, what would you say to somebody like me who is a relative or, or someone who loves someone with MS? Empathy, 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 and listen. That's really, I think, the majority of what we really want is for someone to listen and actually hear what it is we have to say. Mm -hmm. You know, my wife, who literally, you know, we go through life doing this dance that it's not until after the dance is over that I realize we've been doing it all day. Mm -hmm. But, you know, she does things like, you know, grab my arm when, I, you know, I'm walking through a crowd of people where she knows that before I step through that crowd, you know, large groups of people have a spatiality issue, which is, you know, if I step and there's a person a foot away from me, that person a foot away from me can throw off my balance. And where most people, you can just walk through a crowd or walk through a restaurant, walk through tables and go find your seat and sit down. I sometimes have to walk through a restaurant and be aware of every chair, every mm -hmm. person's shoulder that's somewhere near me because mm -hmm. my body reacts to it because I think maybe some way, shape or form, that fight or flight you know, mechanism kicks in where my brain tells me don't bump into that person because it'll knock you down. Yeah. I don't know that. But my wife knows that. And mm -hmm. she responds by putting a hand on my shoulder or mm -hmm. by holding my hand. And that makes me understand that she understands me. Mm -hmm. I don't have to put it in words and verbalize it. She gets it. You know, there are times that I could be in the middle of the day and walk outside and I have, you know, one of those people who have a pretty serious heat aversion. So, you know, just like a computer, if you start to heat up a computer, you know, which is like a brain, you start to heat up a computer, a computer will start to short circuit mm -hmm. and signals don't get through. Well, that's the same thing that happens inside my brain. Mm -hmm. you know, and sometimes I'm not even aware of the fact that I'm getting hot until it's almost too late. But, you know, she's been around me now long enough that she can see it. She can see symptoms. She can see, I don't know whether or not she sees the pores expanding in my nose or the pores expanding <laughs> in my cheek, but she sees it. She'll say to me, aren't you getting hot? And I'll go, you know, I am mm -hmm. with enough warning so that I can get in the air conditioner and make sure that I don't allow myself to continue to get too hot. So I think the primary thing and the most important thing that we want from those who are our loved ones and our caregivers is to just listen. Mm -hmm. And even if you don't understand, I don't mind explaining it to you. And mm -hmm. if I explain it to you, don't look at me like I'm crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, explaining it to you. I mean, when I say sometimes the pain in my feet can be so severe, it feels like somebody's taking a hot iron out of a, out of a fireplace and shoved it up through my heel. That's what it feels like. I, there's no other way to explain it. And that stays there, not for two minutes, not for the second, like when you stepped on the nail, but that's there for 12 hours straight. Now, I got to deal with life. Mm -hmm. And in order to deal with that life, I literally try my best to use multiple techniques of mindfulness to, to put it in a box, put a ribbon around it, tie it off, and stick it over in a corner and try not to look at it. And then it's not that I'm ignoring it, but I don't want to focus on it because when I focus on it, I feel it. Yeah. And that's what I, I think, you know, just, just having a person who's a caregiver or a loved one understand and listen, that's the most important thing. I really love what you said. And, and it's interesting to see how you kind of compartmentalize that. So you can go through the day and you can be that positive and, and amazing person that you are. And I also think what an amazing relationship you and your wife must have. It sounds like it's really beautiful. That is. And it sounds like everyone going through this would benefit from having someone, at least one person, who can hear them, who can listen, and who can be by their side. And Which that's what's so important about this, my MS second act. It gives those who don't have that support system at home a support system that's almost universal. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm hoping that people all over the world get an opportunity to see this and, and go up on the website and, and download the tools to help them 
tell their story better and more succinctly, but then they share it. Mm -hmm. And by sharing it, that'll inspire other people to want to reach out and ask questions. It's okay. Because those same people who take the time to, to tell their story, they're standing by because they're also hoping that maybe they inspire others. So where should people go to get more information? Go to mymsaa.org and you can download you know, our toolkit and understand that you're not alone. I mean, there's a lot of us that are in the same boat. And you know, what's that old saying? It took a lot of us to get here. It's going to take a lot of us to keep moving forward. We are so grateful for the work that you're doing and for putting your name and your face and your celebrity behind it so that people understand it's also not, it's not any one particular group or any one in particular who's going through this, but it will and can affect everyone and the entire family. Well, thank you for all that you're doing and thank you for sharing with our viewers. I know people are going to be very interested in what they can do. I have a cousin who's been riding a tricycle for many years. He's not been able to walk from MS. Sure. And, um, and fortunately, the technology is advancing to the point where, as you said earlier, people are being correctly diagnosed and then they're able to be treated and learn how to live and go on with the disease. It, let that cousin know, be proud of the fact that he's got that tricycle because that tricycle is also helping him exercise with his illness. And mm -hmm. we know that exercise, we know that diet change, we know that mindfulness all will impact the progression of this illness. So if, unfortunately, he can't walk on his own, but, you know, why not roll in, put some spinners on it. He does. He gets around. <laughs> he does. He lifts weights. He does a lot of things to help himself. But again, it's it's all in conjunction one with the other. It's not one single thing. You have to have access to many, many modalities that can help, and especially the people around you. Absolutely. So thank, thank you. So much. No, and thank you. Thank you for getting the word out. We're oh, we'll do our best. And we will be sharing this toolkit with everyone on our website, all of our social media everyone on Channel 6 and everyone who watches this show. Montel, you are such an inspiration to us. Thank you so much for your oh, time you. and sharing with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, be well. Lauren, wasn't that an incredible interview? I can't believe that we just spent that time with Montel uh, Williams. It was so amazing. I was a little bit of a fangirl. You I'm were not totally, <laughs> you were totally, totally starstruck. I was totally <laughs> starstruck. What impresses me so much about him though is is the um, the grace and the dignity yeah. and the positivity that he shares in the midst of this trial in his life. Well, and he's been living with this for many years, which is really what happens mm -hmm. if you're fortunate to live with it for many years, the opportunity to learn how to thrive through it mm -hmm. is really incredible. And the advances in technology and medical knowledge and experience, I'm so grateful to him for sharing it. I mean, you have family who are afflicted. I yes. have family who are afflicted. It's, it's a horrible, horrible situation. Mm -hmm. Anything that can be done to make it better is so worthwhile. Yeah, absolutely. I thought he brought that point across really well. And it was really neat to see um, the corporate sponsorship on mm -hmm. that level and to be able to have them say, you know, we, we want to address this. We want to solve this for you. And I know that, you know, my cousins work with um, the MS Association of America as well. I just know just enough to know that they're truly committed people who are really dedicated to solving it. So it gives me hope as a family member as well. I think so too. Yeah. So we hope you will follow up and look into the My MS Second Act and get whatever information can possibly help you too.